morning we would have just a few. In fact, we have a great turnout, so please help yourself to the food if you have not. I'm going to do a quick introduction to both of our speakers. I'm going to introduce them both now so then they can go one to the other. Uh, so we have Dr. Pete Benfield first. He's used to be the publisher of Public Library of Science One, which is the largest open access journal in the world. Uh, he's now co-founder of the Peer J, which is a new open access journal. And I've known Pete since I worked at the UCSF library, we've been on panels about the future of scholarly communication. He's probably one of the most distinguished publishers currently at work. Dr. Rocco is the biggest fan of the library at the university, except, except me. Uh, and he was also on my uh, search committee when I became the library director, so thank you for endorsing that. And, and, and he and I have had also many conversations about how to evaluate scholarly literature. So I think this will be a, a great discussion, so please take it away. Pete. Yep. Thank you very much, Marcus. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So I, I just live over here in the Bay Area, so it's great to come over the bridge and visit. Um, so I've got about 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to be talking about how should we evaluate scientific publications today. And a little bit wide ranging, I'm going to hit on two or three things. So, so first of all, I want to make the point that what, what do we say when we mean evaluate? And evaluate can mean many things to many different people. And so I just picked up, I guess, three of these things that I'm going to talk about top papers, um, where I'm uh, evaluating something which is sort of ill-defined and called impact or reception or reach or you know, um, the, those kind of concepts. Um, and of course, the impact factor ties into that, which Rich is going to be talking about after. So I won't really talk about the impact factor, but um, I'm looking forward to the debate after we, after we hear Richard's talk. Um, then we, we, could, we could evaluate content based on subjective opinions and evalu evaluation. So these are, here I'm thinking more sort of commentary, discussion around an evaluation. And we could evaluate the integrity of the content, how, how, um, how correct is the content, how well um, trustworthy is the content, those kind of issues. So I'm going to hit on those three. And, um, and then I'm not really going to talk about this, but as, I, as we're going through it, so bear in mind that there's many levels of granularity when you're evaluating stuff. Um, so you can evaluate at the journal level, which obviously the impact factor does, at the article level, which I'm going to be talking about article of metrics, or the paragraph level, or the, 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 the triple, you know, just the concept of a sentence. Um, um, so what level of granularity are you interested in? And, and usually, I think with all these questions you're talking about, what is the uh, what is the point of view of the reader, the, um, the person who's interested in this, rather than trying to impose on the reader your own, your own perception of the evaluation of the other. So let's talk about evaluation impact or reception or reach or interest or readership. It's that kind of concept we're talking about. Um, so here I'm going to start, actually I'm going to back up a little bit because there's a story here that will get us to the, to the point. Um, if we talk first about open access and mega journals, so this is what PLOS One is, uh, which I used to publish before I went to publish PJ. So PLOS One is, is regarded as a mega journal, it's probably the archetypal mega journal, it's certainly the biggest. Um, this year it's going to be publishing about 31,000 articles, so about 2,500 articles a month, which is absolutely huge. So an open access mega journal is usually an online peer reviewed open access journal. Um, it covers all the subject areas, so um, the whole of science, for example, the whole of social sciences, the whole of medicine, those kind of things. Um, it selects content based on the technical soundness, um, and this is the most important bullet, the third bullet. Um, and then with a business model which allows each article to cover its own cost. So if it's online, open access journal, where each article somehow pays for itself, then in some way it can grow to be as large as it needs to be. There's no constraint on the size of the journal. But if we look at that third bullet, um, it selects content based on your technical soundness. So these, these mega journals peer review content 
time, but the peer reviewers are only asked to comment on whether or not the scientific content is correct. Does the, does the data follow the experiment? Does the conclusions follow the data? Those kind of questions. They're not asked, um, what is the degree of advance of this work? How impactful is it? How sexy is it? What is the readership? So they're not asking those questions for the um, perhaps a, a selective high impact factor job like Nature Science might try and do. Um, they're still trying to determine whether the content deserves to be published, deserves to join the scientific literature, and if it does, then the journal goes on to publish it. So that's an important concept. And this is the quarterly output of PLOS One since it launched. So we're now at, um, I guess we're now Q3 2013, but um, this year it's going to publish about 31,000 articles. Um, which is over 3% of the literature. So the literature indexed in PubMed is about a million articles a year, roughly. So 31,000 is about 3% of everything that's in PubMed. And there's 25,000 journals in the world. So one journal is now publishing 3%, and you can see how it's growing uh, quarter over quarter there. And the arrow, the reason I put this arrow in is actually for the literature standard, I guess. This is the day the journal got the impact factor. Um, so the journal is growing very happily, you know, month over month, until the day roughly the year, and that is in 2010, uh, suddenly got an impact factor, and the growth accelerated dramatically. But the journal didn't change at all. There's nothing different about the journal before and after that error. It's simply the fact that it got uh, a number that some people value um, for their publication decisions. Um, so the plus one isn't the only mega journal. There's, there's about 20 or 30 of them now. Um, this is a list of the ones that have launched, at least, um, and PJ is down the bottom, and this is in chronological order. So the ones that have launched, and how many articles they've published since since creation. So PLOS One is the biggest, 75,000 articles, but, and this is uh, through end of 2012, so this is uh, not a complete number now. But th there are others, uh, Scientific Reports from Nature, is a pragmatist mega journal, uh, BMJ Open covers the whole of medicine, for instance, um, and some of these are getting quite big as well. But if you put in all of those uh, journals into the output of the mega journal model, then obviously the output gets bigger. Um, but in addition, there's uh, a whole bunch of other journals that also uh, refuse to judge content based on significance or impact or degree of advance before publication. So there's PLOS One, which is the biggest, most visible. There's those 20 or so very large mega journals that try and cover a very large, broad field. But then in addition, there's this, these lists of journals, which are sort of large series of small journals. Um, so the Frontiers in series um, is originally in neuroscience, but they have a journal like the Frontiers in neurorobotics. Um, so that journal only publishes neurorobotics articles, but when it does that, it only judges them on whether or not they deserve to be published. So it's quite niche, but it still applies this, this same thing to all criteria. Um, so what that means, if you go look at that data, so the bottom line here, the red line is plus one, which is what most people think of when they think of that editorial model. Um, the green line is plus one plus the 20 or so mega journals that have launched. And the blue line at the top is everything. It's plus one plus as mega journals plus all of those other, the BMC series, the medicine series, the frontier series, um, about the third in Darwin. Um, so the point I'm making here is that, that in 2012, there was roughly 45,000 articles published in the world that made no sort of prejudgment on the significance, impact, readership, blah, blah, of, of the content. And in 2013, that, you can see that graph is going to become roughly 80,000, something like that. It's going to roughly double if you follow that curve up. Um, so this year, roughly 8% of the literature is being published in the model which makes no judgment on um, where in the scale of you know, high impact to low impact. Um, that arms So when you do that, um, and if you assume that in the future everything's moving to an open access model, then in the future you've got a whole ton of articles, some of which are being published in, in this model which doesn't determine, predetermine the you know, impact and so on. And then you've got a whole load of other journals which are still trying to sort of traditional journal level filter of, of trying to filter articles into a specific journal title. That's the group on the left. But together they, they sort of pump all these articles into this cloud. And, and who knows what the proportion is of the sort of mega journal content um, versus the traditionally sort of filtered into a journal content. But you know, even if it's say 50 50, um, what you can see is you've got a real problem there in some way. So as a reader, you can't necessarily determine for yourself 
which of these articles was a you know, pre-selected as being good enough to be in nature or in the journal of, of you know, whatever, or articles which simply were pre-judged to be worthy of joining scientific literature. Um, so because of that, uh, there's this, this movement of article of metrics as, as given, given rise to the article of metrics movement, which attempts to look at the article, uh, the specific article that's published, and decide how good or bad or impactful or what degree of advance or sexiness is that individual article. So it doesn't matter which journal that article is published in. It could be published in a plus one, or it could be published in you know, a highly selected, high impact journal. It doesn't matter. You should look at the article itself, not the journal that's published. And so here's a uh, a little grid that um, is in a, a spark primer actually on article of metrics. And so you can see that you can draw a grid between like, long term metrics, metrics which take a while to build up, which you know the traditional citation metrics that might take six months, twelve months to eighteen months to happen, uh, through to immediate and immediate metrics would include things like usage, tweets, Facebook likes. And then whether they're granular, whether they're looking at literally the, the article level or the individual person, or whether they're aggregated at some level to journal the university and country and that kind of thing. Um, so here's our school of metrics aren't new. Um, so these people, this is the Frontiers of the Series again, we're doing it way back in 2008 or thereabouts. So we were looking at the usage and putting it back on our article. Um, PLOS, which is where I was at, probably done most sort of pioneering work here to try and push the concept forward. Um, PLOS AOMs, article level metrics. So if you go to a plus article now, it looks like this. There's a metrics tab. And you can see the section at the top with usage. Um, and you can track that usage over time and get uh, um, an average of the field, for example. And then there's a block of the citations. These are the scope of citations as measured by scope of cross ref. So on, by site. And whether it's been saved by users in Mendeley or in their personal libraries. And whether it's been discussed or recommended. So that's quite a rich data set of um, article and metrics. And the same here, this is our own view from PJ. So this is an article we published um, and sort of grayed out because it's a pop up box, but you can see the back there, we're showing it's had 20,000 page views. Then we're showing the social referrals, where they come from Twitter or Google Plus, the top referrals, so the box cramp.nl, which is a Dutch newspaper. How many times it was tweeted, liked, plus one, and then and then we partnered with one of these third party providers that actually measure article metrics impact story and, and they provide some richer data. So that's what article metrics can look like on a journal. This is one of the providers for metric, and this is actually an article we published last week <coughs> on um, a baby so you used to got a ton of coverage, but it was um, discovered by a high school student while on a, a date with his um, Supervisor, and they went on to publish this article. Um, but this, you know, again, this is just was published last Tuesday, and so already, just a week later, or a week and a couple of days now, we've got a lot of rich information here, and, and you can click on these tags, tabs, and, and go down to see the new articles that both in the class. And um, the demographics is quite interesting, it shows you where the readership is coming from, and, and so on. And the score is, um, the score is particularly interesting. Um, here we go. Because they put it in context. So you know, this is actually, this is in fact the highest scoring article ever in this journal on this score of 326. And compared to articles of a similar age, you know, across the whole of academia or across PJ and, and so on. So it's, it's rather nice. Um, Um, at the bottom. Which just done full screen. Uh, you can go at the bottom. I think we've got it. So they, yeah. Hopefully everyone's still seeing it online. Um, so the, these are some of the all, all metrics providers. All metric itself is a company, it's a for profit company, um, actually in a, a new trader startup run by Macmillan, which is part of uh, or Nature Publishing Group is part of the Macmillan Empire, so it's sort of attached to Nature. Um, Impact Story, which is a not for profit. And Plum Analytics, which is a, a, another company that's trying to provide article level metrics data, um, and also other data as well. So they're not just looking at metrics; they're looking at software, uh, GitHub commits, slide shares, that kind of thing. So um, the output of a, an individual researcher isn't just mm -hmm. articles; it could be many other things. But I'm just talking about articles because we're talking about journal publishing. 
So one of the effects of the megalodonal is um, you know, this incredible improvement in the efficiency of the way the ecosystem operates. So if you peer review content only to um, decide whether it deserves to join the literature, then you only need to peer review it once. There's a yes no answer, does it deserve to join the literature or does it need to be revised or rejected, and then you can publish it. The traditional model is that um, you submit your article to a top tier journal, Nature for example, they'll peer review your article. And it may turn out to be entirely publishable um, and nothing, but it's not impactful enough for their journal. And so they'll reject that article and it'll move, you know, the authors will take it down to a sort of next journal down on the, this imaginary chain, submit it to the next one down, which is usually based on impact factor, and have it re-reviewed at that journal, and again found to be publishable, but perhaps not impactful enough for that journal. And you move down this, this um, awful sort of chain of uh, publication until finally a journal, you know, will accept you even though you were acceptable right at the start of the process. The, the mega journals of their choice model doesn't do that, but um, you know, what, what that model causes is it's basically filtering content into those 25,000 journals that I mentioned. And it's trying to filter on impact or, or some other similar word of metric. And uh, it's doing that based on the input of two peer reviewers and an editor. So perhaps two or three readers would read that article pre-publication before the world gets to read it decide whether it's worthy enough to join this journal or not, and then not join that journal or not. Um, and this is just an example of the waste that that, that causes. So this article, um, written by Cameron Naylor, who's um, now the advocacy director of PLOS, was apparently rejected from at least six journals, including Nature, Nature Genetics, Nature Methods, and Science. It took over a year for it to get it published, and um, went on to become his most cited paper over 150 citations. So, the waste inherent in that, you know, it wasted time so that the world didn't get the benefit of this finding for over a year when it could have been published more promptly. And God knows how many reviewers and editors were involved in re-reviewing the same paper many times until it finally got published. Um, this, this lab, the Grigoria lab, are so pissed off with this situation that they've gone out and <laughs> basically formed a, an extra page on their lab website where people can upload their rejection stories and um, <laughs> how many times their the great work was rejected until finally it was published and there's basically no, no change. Um, so it's been estimated by a company out here called Rubric that as many as 15 million hours a year are wasted in this kind of redundant peer review process simply to try and filter content into 25,000 buckets of jobs. The, the wasted hours, uh, you know, the way they've done the calculation, are not necessarily improving the paper, they're literally just trying to find the level for that article, which is, is crazy, because the alternative, of course, is to decide whether it's just published, and then publish it, and let the world figure out where, in, in some scale, um, that article slips. So, and I'm going to sort of wrap all this up in a, a big story. So, number two is this concept of subjective opinions and evaluations. So, so this is really in people leaving in comments. Um, so you can, of course, read an article and form an opinion about it that wouldn't get tweeted or Facebook liked or whatever. And usually you, you'd go and discuss that with somebody around the water cooler or, or you, you know, you know, just talk to somebody over lunch. Um, and that, that insight about whether that article is good or bad gets lost um, because it's just sort of informal insight by one of the 20,000 readers, for example. Um, but now, of course, with you know, internet technology, you can leave comments on articles. So this is the, you know, the functionality on PHA. On PHA, you can leave questions and answers. People can ask a question, and anyone, anyone can ask a question, anyone can answer a question. Usually, you would imagine it's the author answering a question about the article, but it could be anyone. And uh, here's just an example of how it works. You click on the paragraph, you, you leave the question, somebody leaves an answer, that answer can be accepted, it can be voted up or down like a stack overflow. People who then answer, answer and ask the question get, as it were, points because they've been voted up or down. Uh, and so that, that, I guess, institutional knowledge or that, that informal knowledge of a reader could be captured and, and you know, retained. And this is that academic contribution program that we have. So for every interaction we have in our system, people get contribution points and, and you, you become, as it were, the top reviewer in neurology or the top answerer of questions in ecology. And, and, and um, you can have a real sort of reputation metric built up around the, the sort of knowledge inherent in the academic community. Uh, PubMed Central has just launched something similar. So now if you go to PubMed Central, this is in beta at the moment. If you go to PubMed Central, you can leave a comment on any article that's um, indexed in the, actually in the whole of PubMed. I think you can leave PubMed comments on the industry. Um, and then this is, this is a nice one I wanted to talk about while I was here. So, 
Did anyone know or read or hear about this science thing a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> good, good job, Marcus. Yeah. Um, so this was a this was a journalistic article actually published in Science uh, three or four weeks ago, fourth of October. And a journalist had gone out and he, he basically created a fake paper. Um, literally, he made the paper up, he made the authors up, and he submitted to, to about 300 journals. Uh, and he submitted it exclusively to open access journals and open access journals, mostly that were known to be somewhat dodgy. He sort of stacked the, the study, and it wasn't a study, it was a journalistic study. But lo and behold, about 150 of those journals accepted this fake article um, and were willing to publish it. And the, the point here is that there are, you know, there are what are called predatory open access publishers out there that because of the business model that exists in open access, one of the main ones, which is as an author, you pay for the publication of an article. Um, there's an incentive, you know, a conflict of interest incentive for the publisher to accept your article because you pay it money. So there are now publishers springing up around the world, or publishers in quotes, that um, basically do no peer review on your, your article, um, or just reproduce it, publish it, um, probably with no oversight at all. Uh, they have an editorial board that don't even know they're on the editorial board and so on, and, and they publish it. So this, this thing exposed that, and it's been you know, widely talked about in the open access world, because this is a problem, and this is sort of the dark underbelly of the open access world. These people are you know, clearly scam, scam artists. It's been likened to the, the Nigerian oil scam of the publishing world. Um, but the reason this happens is because of the peer review process. So it's nothing to do really with open access, actually. It's because the peer review process is currently um, opaque. So for any journal, even for Nature, you submit your article to the journal, they get usually anonymous peer reviews back, and then there's a discussion between the editor and the author where they, they revise and you submit the paper, and the paper is published. And the paper is published without those peer reviews attached to it, without any real evidence or proof that a peer review even happened. You assume a peer review happened because it's Nature and you trust Nature. But you have no proof of that, and that's the same for 99% of the journals in the world. So these guys, because, uh, as it were, the, the natural behavior of the academic community is, is to keep the peer review system completely secret and opaque, they can take advantage of that and pretend that their articles have been peer reviewed and publish them. Um, now, there, there was lots of problems with the study, one of which was, you know, there was no control. So they didn't submit this fake article to subscription journals to see if those guys would have accepted it as well, in which case it would be much more clear that it's a fake peer review. But, Luckily, somebody else has done the control for us. Um, so, uh, this person, who is called uh, Diedrich Stapel, was an actual researcher in, in Holland, um, and a real researcher, but he was basically a fraudulent fraudulent, um, and submitted, I think, 50 or 60 fake articles. Uh, they're effectively fake articles that made up data, and, and you know, they should never have been published. Um, and in fact, uh, 54 at the last count, I think, were found. And of course, he was found out there was an investigation, a previous screenshot, and, and you know, he was fired. But um, lo and behold, one of the journals that accepted this fake article was, in fact, a science record, um, who then went on to retract it. So, so this man has effectively done the control for us. He submitted 54 fake articles to the subscription journals, who all accepted it um, and, and went on to publish it until you know, like his university did an investigation in it. Um, so the, the problem is not limited to open access. Uh, this is another example from, nature, uh, from science. And this is the infamous arsenic light paper that's still you know, unretracted and published, but many people believe it's, it's completely you know, fake, fake finding, at least. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an incorrect finding, which has been apparently peer reviewed by science, but they, they never made the peer reviews public and has been published. So uh, there's, there's a concept of open peer review. Um, an open peer review will make that problem disappear overnight. Um, open peer review is the concept that there's, there's two elements to it. Either the peer reviewers can be named to the authors, so they're openly named, the authors know who their peer reviewers were, or um, the final published paper reproduces the peer reviews on, on the published paper, so there's evidence, as it were, on the publication of what the peer review process that it went through. You get to see the reviews and the rebuttal from the revisions. Um, and there are journals that have practiced open peer review, and we're one of them, but down here, this is in alphabetical order, in the last. But um, again, there's the BMJ Open, um, the EMBO journal, which is actually not a non-open access journal, but practices open peer review. Um, the Frontiers journals, the BMC, uh, 
kind of medicine journals. Uh, so there are a lot of journals that are now attempting to, I guess, clean up the peer review process and make it much more publicly transparent, which allows, again, and this comes back to this issue of evaluation, it allows the readers to evaluate that content and see for themselves whether or not it was had the integrity. Um, uh, and these are just some quotes we got back about our own peer review. I mean, basically, people can now go in and see that perhaps reviewer number three in the bottom left made a stupid comment, and the authors, you know, rebutted them with some crushing repost in, in their final <laughs> lesson. Uh, at the moment, about 20% of PJ reviewers are naming themselves in the system. It's optional. And about 80% of the authors are providing this, this peer review history on their published papers. So, so then this is just now wrapping it up. So to get back, so when we talk about evaluating impact or reception or, or, or there are options now and, and many of them can be faster, act faster than a citation metric aggregated up at the journal level and the article level metrics is the best example of that. Yeah. Then there's ways to, ways to evaluate content based on, as it were, personal interactions, personal opinions about an article, you know, capture the comments. <coughs> Those comments can actually become part of the article level metrics display as well. And there could be a, a real discussion going on there between the authors and, and the commenters. And there are ways now to evaluate the integrity, the, the correctness of the article. You, you can actually go and see with some journals whether it's been peer reviewed and what the peer reviewed comments were, whether there was weaknesses pointed out or not. Um, <coughs> peer review is no guarantee that an article is correct. But at least now, with some of these journals, you can actually see what's going on you know, under the hood and, and you know, prepare yourself as an author for the knowledge of, of the system. And again, what level of grand manager? So you need to ask yourself that question every time you're And that's me. That's my talk. And we'll add you to it. Do you want to say There's a few questions for Pete, then Dr. Rocco, and then we officially end at 1, but we started late. So if people want to stay, we can go to 1.15 or so for Q&A. So are there any questions right now before Dr. Rocco? Okay, well, hold on questions to the end, please. So you want to get perfect presentation. <laughs> I answer all your questions. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate everyone coming. Hi. Uh, I, I enjoyed the talk very much. I feel, I have to say right up front, I feel very much like the college student on the debate team who's been given an assignment to uh, defend a position that he doesn't believe in. And so I am here to talk about the impact factor. I feel also to tell you where my head's at. We just listened to a talk, in my opinion, about, I'm struggling for a metaphor, um, neurosurgery, robotic neuromicrosurgery. And I'm here to tell you we can do it with a sharp stone instead. <laughs> <laughs> in thinking about the impact factor, what I would like to do quickly in my time is, one, tell you what it's all about as far as uh, I know and what I've learned over the years, and I've been using it for many years. I've been talking about it in class for many years. I will not spend much time on its limitations, but instead my talk will be on how it can be used by students in a useful way. So what is it good for? The student challenge that we all encounter, we give you the assignment. Find a clinical trial article in the medical literature on a drug or a treatment protocol that interests you. Use that article, do a class presentation or a term paper, blow the professor away and get an A. That's it. Isn't that what we're all about? Here's the problem. Where to find the best article? In my opinion, you stack the odds in your favor with a high-level clinical trial article. You don't want to come into class and do a 15-minute presentation that you're being graded on and then get tripped up with weaknesses in the article that others are aware of and you may not be. You got a better chance of getting to Chicago in a 2013 Lexus rather than a broken down 83 Honda with a bad transmission. The impact factor I will show will assist you in finding the Lexus. You're playing the odds in your favor. I actually encountered this uh, a few weeks ago. Students were looking for a clinical trial article on hyaluronic acid injections for a presentation. 
because I teach pharmacology, they ask me about what's new, where, where would they go, what article should they select to talk about. Finding articles on this subject in medicine is extremely easy. Finding a high-level article is the challenge. If you do Google, as I did, for uh, hyaluronic acid injections into intra-articular joints, 215,000 hits. If you do Google Scala, you're down to 11,800. PubMed, 563. If you further refine the search through PubMed specific clinical trials, you're down to 188. But again, I'm speaking to my fellow students. It's 10 o'clock p.m. The paper's due tomorrow. You've got 188 choices. Pick one. You can go to the Journal of Interest or Choice pick that journal, go to the website, and ask for a clinical trial article in that journal. I did that for the New England Journal of Medicine. I got 11 hits. That's more reasonable. But then the question comes down to, and I mean this with uh, all due respect to the students, how do you judge a clinical article? Well, some of us teach an entire course, research methods course, uh, two, three credits for an entire semester, it's that challenging. There's a lot of information that you need. There's a lot of background that you need. You need to do a lot of reading of articles in clinical trials. Many students have not had the opportunity to learn those procedures and techniques, and yet you're still asked to do a paper. Was the article uh, use, did it use power analysis? Were random and systematic errors controlled for? On and on. What's the width of the confidence interval? Was the follow-up sufficiently complete? What was the likelihood ratio at 95% confidence interval? Who's got the time to figure that out? The impact factor, I will propose, is a way of getting to a high-level article quickly and can be useful in sorting through the vast amount of literature that's available on any subject, including this hyaluronic acid subject. The impact factor, by way of background, was developed by a gentleman named Eugene Garfield. Uh, I believe he's still alive. Uh, he worked for the, or founded the Institute for Scientific Information, which was purchased by Thomson Reuters. And he started the impact factor in 1975. The range of numbers associated with the journals can go from zero to slightly over 50. And the impact factor represents the number of times in a journal, on average, that an article published in that journal is cited by other articles. It's a simple concept. If it's a good article, other people are going to use it. Other people are going to cite it. Physicians are going to use that technique and publish their own articles using that technique. Bench scientists are going to say, wow, I love this. I'm going to try it myself. And so the impact factor reflects a sort of usefulness in the marketplace. How many times did you use it? Now, I don't have the time or, frankly, the interest to tell you about the downsides of the impact factor. There are many. If the article is good, others will use it and publish. The impact factor, however, is not many things. It is, it is a surrogate marker. It is not a marker of journal quality. It is only an average measure of citations. If an impact factor of three is assigned to a journal, it means that the average number of citations received for each paper published in the last two years in that journal was three times. Three of the scientists felt that article was worth repeating, that experiment, that surgical technique. Reviews, letters to the editor, editorials are not included in the calculations. Okay. 
by way of overview, I downloaded the um, Excel spreadsheet that's freely available from Reuters, Thomson Reuters, which <coughs> looks at 8,238 science journals, many of which are in medicine, but not all. 8,238. And the impact factor of 3,260 of them are less than one. Impact factor 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And that's about 40% of all those published journals. Impact factors between 1 and 2, 2,210 journals out of that 8,200 for about 27%, all the way down to the highest impact factors ever recorded in the history of science, of which there are a range between 30 and 50. I think 53 in medicine may be the highest. It's the New England Journal of Medicine. And the number of those journals, 19. In fact, when you add up the numbers as I did, 92.5% of science journals have impact factors of less than five. Okay. The point that I want to demonstrate in my short talk is that if I were looking for an article on hyaluronic acid and I wanted to make the greatest impact on the audience, my fellow students and the teacher, I'd go here. I'd find one here, or maybe here. Now, the abuse of the impact factor is legion. It's, it's, it's awful. There are some universities that will not include a publication in your um, a submission in your CV for uh, tenure if you haven't published in a journal of, with an impact factor of above five. Somehow there's a magic number about five. Unfortunately, it's led to a bad, well-deserved bad reputation for the impact factor. Does that mean a great article, a great clinical trial cannot be published in an impact factor of one? Of course not. Of course not. Dr. Benfield reminded me of a number of stories, some of which I've talked about in class. Rosalind Yallow, Nobel Prize in Medicine, for discovering what? Immunoassay. Science rejected the article repeatedly. She had to go from science, impact factor way up in the stratosphere, up here, to an impact factor journal of about two. And that one article won her the Nobel Prize in Medicine, a check for $1.1 million. So much of what Dr. Binfield talked about resonated with me. However, as a student, I'm in a hurry. I'm carrying five classes. Where do I find that hyaluronic acid article right off the bat that's going to get the job done for me? The impact factor can help you uh, achieve that goal. Another abuse of the impact factor is that if you go to the website of all science journals, medical journals especially, they will tout the impact factor. If they had a 4.5 last year and it jumped to 5.2, it'll be a banner across the website. Here is my issue of Nature that came in last week, and uh, they have this uh, glued on over the cover advertisement along with my address sticker <laughs> touting that they have a 38.597-26843125724 impact factor. It's a little silly carrying it out to three places. But they are telling the world that we're up there in the stratosphere at 38. On average, the articles that we publish is, this is what they're saying. This is what they want us to believe. The article that we publish is going to be cited, on average, over the next two years, 38 times. 38 other groups of scientists will regard what we've published as significant enough to, to repeat the work. One of the things Dr. Benfield mentioned that was very important, uh, that reflects the weakness of the impact factor system is that an article may come into Nature or Science or New England Journal of Medicine and it may have all of the requirements for being a top-level 
journal article, a top-level clinical trial, perfect in every way, but it won't get published. And one of the reasons it won't get published is because Nature of Science and New England Journal of Medicine have this underlying rule. If it's been already described, we won't publish it. If somebody has already done it, if the Cleveland Clinic found out that uh, ciprofloxin is perfect for treating um, uh, Lyme disease, we're not going to publish the follow-up article, even though the follow-up article is perfect in every way and is a study of 5,000 patients instead of the original, which was 500. That leads to um, a problem, and it's been pointed out, but it also impacts the impact factor. So, uh, well, I've already said this, I won't repeat myself, but if you look at the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, having an impact factor of 53, uh, I uh, challenged a class some time ago, I teach in podiatric medicine, and I challenged the students in class to go online to the New England Journal of Medicine and look up an article which they felt was regulate, which was reflected podiatric medicine, a super specialty in medicine. And one of the diseases that podiatrists deal with is Charcot foot or Charcot ankle. And I had the student do a Google search on New England Journal of Medicine, just that journal for Charcot. 29 articles. So I will finish with a comparison to hopefully demonstrate my point. Uh, I actually did this at random. The students came up with the question about hyaluronic acid injections. And I said, fine, let me go to an impact factor journal of something around 9.1, uh, around 10. And I chose the Annals of Rheumatic Disease and did a search on the journal uh, site, website, and hit the first article and grabbed it. I also went to a low-level journal of 0 0.5 and did the same thing and grabbed that first article. They were both published in 2010. And then quickly, I will simply go through what I found. To make the point that by going to the high impact factor journal, I've increased my chances of doing a better job in class. The, my Dan article was not placebo controlled, but yes, well described by Jorgensen. There was no randomization, yes. The drug were identical. The doses were very similar, 20 and 25 and 20. The frequency of dosing was once a week identical. The number of weeks was five. Anesthesia was 1% lidocaine, as it was here. And the duration of the study was 32, eh, basically 52 similar. The number of patients was 15 versus 335. A high-impact journal is not going to publish an article on 15 patients on a procedure and technique that's been published a hundred times already. There's nothing new. It doesn't turn the corner and make us think of something in a new way. Power analysis was not used. This is the statistical package that tells you how many patients you have to do. Jorgensen had to do 151, so he did 165 and 170 as a buffer. Informed consent was the same in both. The results were not blinded. The examiners who were looking at the patients and measuring range of motion after the hyaluronic acid injections, they knew what the patient got. Here, the examiners were double-blinded. The patient didn't know if they got saline or hyaluronic acid, and the examiner didn't know which one you got. They were simply measuring either uh, uh, range of motion or some other parameter. The age range was 20 to 80, which is questionable about including such a wide range of patients in such a small number. Here, it's more reasonable, the adult, almost geriatric population. Exclusion criteria were well described in both articles. The ADRs, adverse drug reactions, they were not reported. Do you mean I've injected 
uh, what is it, five times five weeks or uh, repeatedly hyaluronic acid into a, a joint on the patient and there were no adverse reactions? That's interesting. Here, of course, the realistic representation that, yes, we had some ADRs and here's what they are. The treatment compliance was not given. 99% of the patients completed the study. In the placebo, 95% completed the study. A very important parameter that adds to the credibility of the clinical trial. How many patients actually finished? You started with 500 and you ended up with 20? That, you need to know that. That's important information. Um, finally, more details. Synovial fluid aspiration was not done here. Yes, it was done to prevent dilution. Follow-up was 32 weeks. Again, I don't see that as significant difference. Uh, analgesic used during the study? Anything you want. Wow. <laughs> anything you want. Go to CVS and buy anything. So, <laughs> all drugs were discontinued except for acetaminophen, and the number of acetaminophen pills that you took during the 52-week study were counted. So we knew exactly. If you tripled your dose without telling us, how can we say it was the hyaluronic acid injections that reduced the pain and not the fact that you doubled up? And then finally, uh, the main outcome measure will visual analog scale questionnaire that I have no uh, uh, criticisms of. Uh, this is an algo functional index score that I was not familiar with. I had to go download it, which I did. The number of questions were 6 versus 11, and I'm not qualified to judge whether that's good or bad. And the scorings were 0 to 10 versus 24. The questionnaires were administered at 4, 8, 11, identical. Again, I don't see a big issue there. Finally, the issue has to do with the results, which is what the students will be spending most of their time on. The student is not going to talk about the power analysis and the subtleties of it, etc. It's irrelevant. What is relevant is, does this stuff work? What have I learned? Well, here, all the data was provided with no standard deviation. So we don't know if the results were among the patients were 5, 86, 21, and 11, or whether the results among the patients were 5, 6, 5.5, 5.2. Which of those two data sets are you going to believe? Without the SD, we have no idea. Here, the responders, are, the data was, was presented in a uh, complete and uh, transparent fashion. Finally, the results. Me, Dayan, said that of 13 of 15 patients improved. Wow. That, that's significant. Improvement by 20% in the range of motion. A significant reduction in pain using the visual analog scale. How do you run it as a valued conservative treatment for osteoarthritis? That's what he's telling our patients. Based on a study in which patients were allowed to take whatever drugs they wanted, they didn't have to tell us. On the other hand, Jorgensen, time to recurrence showed no significant treatment, change from baseline showed no treatment effect, the sediment for the consumption, global assessment, responder rates, and adverse events, no significant difference. And he, this is a quote from the summary of the paper, hyaluronic acid is without clinical effect. So. In conclusion for me, I think the impact factor is flawed at many levels. I, however, feel it can be a useful guideline for students, for any of us, who want to go right to the best article and increase the chances that we're going to get an article that will stand up to criticism and allow us to do a presentation in class or do a term paper that focuses on the topic and does it in a way that ensures or at least improves our chances of saying we've covered all the bases. And that's my argument and I'm standing by it and good luck Red Sox. Thank you. <laughs>
Now that you've heard both sides, so to speak. <laughs> Where is the impact factor published on an article? Or how do you find that? And how do you find it? Uh, it's very easy. You go to Google, and <laughs> seriously, you go to Google, <laughs> and you type in impact factor, and then the name of the journal. And the first hit, maybe the second, will be that information. You often will see it right in the, the, the header for that hit. Um, you find them on the journal website itself. It's on the opening page for almost all journals, uh, except the ones that have a 0 0.5. Uh, they may not tout it on the website. Uh, but it's easy to find either through Google as a general search with the journal name followed by, uh, preceded by impact factor, or go to the journal itself. I do it in class. I have the students Google uh, any journal, and bang, they get it in like three tenths of a second, and you've got the note. And again, I don't need to. I'm repeating myself, but I, I feel compelled to say it. It's a surrogate marker of quality. It's not a guarantee. Questions? Uh, this is for both of you, and it, it's about the articles being cited by other articles. And it seems to me that that isn't always a positive thing. And in relationship to the impact factor, sometimes doesn't it take longer than two years for an article to come out that might cite another article? Yes. Yeah, so why well, I, I can't. So yet. Yeah. People get cited for negative reasons, so that the man with 54 retractions is probably getting a lot of citations now for the fact that he was retracted. Um, and so his, uh, not his personal impact factor, but his personal sort of number of citations to his own corpus would look really good now, if you simply looked at the number. Um, so yeah, it, there's, no, uh, you know, there's no signal in the fact that there's a citation, and that's a problem. Um, and uh, the other half of the question is? Well, that had more to do with the impact factor. Was it sometimes with the research and publication? Oh, the length of time, yeah. Doesn't it take longer than two years? So, yeah, years? I mean, they, they just pick this two-year window. So it, it's a uh, two-year window measured in the third year. And, um, yeah, definitely uh, some journals and some articles take a lot longer to get citations. And uh, the same database, Web of Science, actually measures the half-life, so it shows you how quickly those citations do accrue. So it can actually give you some idea of, as it were, the speed of, you know, the citations are put into that journal, so they, they do try and measure that. But, you know, it was never, the impact factor was never invented for this kind of reason, to look at individual articles or, or even to be used as, you know, a student tool necessarily. It was originally invented as a way for librarians to, to decide which journals to buy, because you want to buy, on average, a better quality journal, and, um, and so if you see the impact factor of 50, you know, you're more likely to want to spend your money buying that than an impact factor of 0.5. So, but then over the, you know, three or four decades since has been used for many other reasons. So that's the problem, actually. Uh, and and I, I do agree with Richard. You know, in many cases, it's an OK metric, as long as you remember all of the sort of failings of it. But uh, it gets abused so badly that it, it's, it's not a good metric for everything. It's, it's interesting that Google, the page rank algorithm, was actually based on, on the same concept. Mm -hmm. that. So the, actually, the exact same concept. That they, built page rank based on the um, impact factor, basically. Um, you had mentioned that the peer review process is now being opened up with some of the journals. Why was it closed to begin with? So I think that, you know, there's been a lot of debate as to whether, you know, keeping it entirely anonymous and closed is, is a good thing. So, for instance, there's gender issues. You know, if you make your, the name of the uh, reviewer known um, or the or even the author's name known to the reviewers, this is the concept of blind versus double blind, then that can influence the review you get. If, if you know what country or institution an author is from, for instance, you know, uh, and vice versa, that can influence the review. Um, as to why the, the reviews haven't been published in the past, I think it's just a hangover from the print days. You know, th there was a limited amount of space, so why waste it on publishing all the reviews and basically comment on the draft versions? Um, when, when you've got the final correct answer, as it were. So, so I think now it's much more of a sort of internet savvy attitude, like, well, we've got unlimited space, we might as well publish all of this evidence. So it's closed on both ends as well? The author is also... It the depends on the journal. The author uh, no, um, so some journals publish double blind, or practice double blind, where the reviewers don't know who the authors were and vice versa. Some are single blind, where simply the authors don't know who the reviewers are, and then some are open, where everyone knows everyone. Yeah. And normally, 
Historically, journals have always published once a year uh, a list of the reviewers. You just don't know which articles they reviewed. Um, or how often. Or, or how often uh, or how good they are. They was just volunteer. I've been a reviewer. And you just sign up and they're glad to have someone else to read <laughs> the damn things. <laughs> Well, I also think you're not talking about any of the politics involved. Um, I mean, some of the more specific uh, areas of study, people know who, you know, it's, there, there's sort of an old boys club about what gets published. It's, it's not as anonymous as... As you might hope. Yes. As my scientists might put forward. But anyway, um, my question was is if... Um, they have this parameter, the old-fashioned parameter, which is the IF. What parameters might be used in the open access that would be clear? So I think, well, the, the article level metrics, there was that donut with a score in the middle. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of almost intended to replace um, the impact factor, but only at an article level. So that article had a score of, I think, 326. So in theory, that article has had more impact in the world than a score of 100. You know, oh. So people are attempting, <coughs> attempting to take all of these signals, number of tweets, number of citations, downloads, Facebook likes, whatever, and roll them up to some single number that then you know, a person can digest. But it's, it's all the same problem happening again. You, know, it's, you can gain those numbers. Um, a score 326 may mean something to somebody, but it's irrelevant to somebody else who actually only cares about Facebook likes. Right. Um, you know, so tweets. you're saying that you're using an impact factor like scale at the okay. level, but it could be that at one point in time, everybody really likes, you know, yeah. cats and cats, and so <laughs> there's a huge explosion of kids. So some of them are doing that, but PLOS, PLOS, for instance, is consciously not doing that. It's just providing the raw data and let people figure it out themselves. Some of these other providers are trying to roll it up to a number. But it's sort of very early days for this field, and people are still figuring out how to use these numbers to give the, the kind of signals, you know, that Richard was talking about, is this actually a, an article worth studying or citing in the future? Because citations take one, two, three, five years to accrue, and, and uh, so it may be good as a teaching tool, you know, where you're just looking for, you know, the, the answer, um, but perhaps as a research tool where you want to know what, what, what of today's research was worth reading, something a bit faster is, is more important. Questions back here? Or anyone else? I agree with oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just curious, is, is anybody trying to identify or create a score that's based on the universe, that's the universe of individuals to whom that article is relevant? I mean, you could have a profound article come out, but it's just related to some technical area of yeah. science that the world doesn't understand, except for point zero 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 five percent of it. Yes. And it would never get the base. And I think, yeah, I think that's the, um, that's as it were, the, the holy grail of the next frontier for these people. Um, it doesn't matter if you're asked about 100 tweets. If you've got one tweet from the Nobel Prize winner, right. that's the important tweet. Exactly. And so it's a matter of knowing who is the network that's providing those signals. And, and there are people, you could Google eigenfactor. Um, so there are people trying to do it perhaps at a more journal level, but they're actually interested in the network effect. So right. it doesn't matter if there was a number of citations, it's where are those citations coming from that are more important than that there wasn't simply a large number of them. And, and so they're, they're, Soon, I'm sure they'll be taking that concept they've developed at the journal level and bringing it down to the article or, or the individual. But I think that's a hard. It, it's a social graph of Facebook, isn't it? It's, it's knowing who your friends are and whether or not they're important to you. you know, and for your but, article. but have you recently had dinner with the Nobel Prize? Funnily enough, I um, I actually held two Nobel prizes last Friday. Um, so uh, uh, Linus Pauling um, was at Oregon State as an undergraduate, and I was talking there uh, last week. And uh, they've got the Linus Pauling archives, and they got, he won two, two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry and one for peace. And they got them out, and I held two Nobel Prize winners, prizes, uh, which was rather cool, actually. But I didn't have dinner with him, he's dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just share a little experience that I've had more from the faculty side rather than the student side? And that is, uh, outside of uh, North America, where I spent most of my career, Impact factors have, uh, have huge uh, Im impact. <laughs> they're, they're used in, in ways that, you know, like you say, they were never imagined to be. Because I spent eight and a half years in Hong Kong, and my perception of a Hong Kong academic is that they really like numbers, formulas. I like to be able to describe a score. And I've been involved in uh, what they call the RAE, the Research 
uh, assessment exercises in both the UK and twice in Hong Kong. And it's all about the numbers. And of course, you get people with some really split hairs because, of course, you've got the range, as you say, from first to zero to 53 or something. So, but, you know, people argue, okay, well, I published in the, in the journal Physical Therapy, which at the time might have been 3.0. One, but it is the number one journal in rehab or in physical therapy. So really, a 3.1 impact factor for me should be like a 53 in the New, New England Journal of Medicine, because this is the highest I could ever get. You see, and as you start doing all that kind of stuff, and people start getting hired and fired on the basis of impact factors, and then they start saying, well, they start coming up with formulas where they say, well, here's the impact factor, and you divide by the number of authors, and then you look at the position of you on the author list, and if you're not number one, two, or the final one, then you get zero. I mean, there's all kinds of abuse. It's just, it's just there are, um, I, abuse is a good word. There are some, I've read some Chinese universities, major universities in China that will not, um, uh, grant tenure if you haven't published in an impact factor of five or above. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, again, uh, my talk was not centered on defending the impact factor in any way. It was to show how it could be used to find a better article uh, and increase your chances of doing a good job on an assignment. I, mean, no, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. I agree with yeah. No, I agree as well. A million articles a year. Yes. Uh, I mean, I tell students that they have a thousand clearly. You know, I mean, how, how, how are you? Yeah. It's a good place to start from that perspective. But there, there are some interests. So I, I pulled up some screenshots. You know, in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, um, somebody is, you know, people have done actually several studies now correlating retraction rates with impact factor. And Nijum here has, you know, the highest retraction rate versus impact factor. So, you know, the, the, what's going on here is potentially people are either rushing to publish or they're trying to set up their article to get it into this high impact factor journal that's later found out to be incorrect. And so, you know, this conceivably says the chances of that, that article that you pull up randomly may in future be found to be wrong because they, you know, they were trying to get it into a, a high impact factor journal. So I think that's an interesting thing. I'd like to add to that if I could, Peter, though. Um, in the case that I selected at random, those two journals, I think the one that was in uh, Annals of Rheumatic Disease is going to get more criticism. It's, people are going to find issues because it's a major statement. This technique doesn't work. And, or even if it said this technique does work. They're going to spend more time. I know as a scientist, I would spend more time on this higher level clinical trial to see if in fact there's a problem. And that could lead to retraction. That really could lead to attraction. And uh, the number of, the amount of time that I would spend on the 0 0.5 article, quite honestly, for me, because I'm so busy, just the after. Zero. Zero. And then I'd like to add one other point, especially because of the this thing, uh, uh, the if I may use the term, the psychotics who publish papers that are totally made up with fabricated data, they're not going to go as part of their sickness to a 0 0.5 journal. They're going to try to get it in the highest impact. It's like trying to be on NBC instead of the local uh, channel on, in Oakland. I'd rather be in New York on national television. And I think that drives the rejections too. So those two factors uh, drive a high rejection rate among the uh, high impact factor journals. So one, time for one last question. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks to you too. Okay, I can have lunch.